For months, SpaceX has been gearing up for the first ever orbital test flight of Starship. Now that the company is in the final stages of preparation, there is a high probability that Starship might launch in around six weeks. Let's review the key events that took place in the last few days at Starbase. After spending more than a month inside the Mega Bay, undergoing final preparations ahead of the orbital flight, Super Heavy Booster 7 was rolled out to the launch site on January 8. As you can see in this LabPadre rover cam footage, the engine shields were completely fitted around the booster's Raptor engines before rollout. These shields will protect the engines from fire and debris during tests and launches. The shields were not fully installed during the previous six static fire tests of Booster 7, as it was easier for the teams to connect the engines to the orbital launch mount plumbing system without the shields. But the upcoming 33-engine static fire would be so powerful that the shields would be required to safeguard the engines. Booster 7 was lifted and placed atop the orbital launch mount early Monday morning. Hours later, Ship 24 was moved towards the launch mount, and the launch tower arms were lowered to begin stacking operations. Ship 24 was slowly lifted with the tower arms and stacked atop Booster 7 on Monday afternoon. This is the third time these prototypes have been stacked on the launch mount for pre-launch tests. In this close-up footage, you can see that SpaceX has removed the steel compression ring from all three vacuum-optimized Raptor engines of Ship 24. The compression rings prevent vibrations and stabilize vacuum-optimized engines during static fire testing at sea level. The removal of the rings indicates that Ship 24 has completed all the static fire tests necessary before the orbital flight. Another noticeable change is that the Ship 24's Raptor engine chill vents are now redirected below Booster 7's grid fins. This will ensure that the venting is not pumped into the Starship quick disconnect arm and grid fin mechanisms. On Thursday, January 12, SpaceX attempted to conduct a full-stack propellant loading test. However, the test was aborted before the propellants were loaded onto the ship. The test resumed on Friday, January 13. At around 11.35 a.m. local time, SpaceX began loading propellants into the oxygen and methane tanks of Booster 7. Within about 20 minutes, the oxygen tank was filled to about 25% of its capacity, and the methane tank was filled to almost 15% of its capacity. The booster was kept in that state for several minutes, and in the meantime, propellant loading into Ship 24 began, and engine chill vent was observed through the newly installed extension. At around 12.15 p.m., propellant offloading from Booster 7 began, marking the conclusion of the Booster 7 propellant loading test. With Ship 24 partially filled with propellants, SpaceX performed a quick disconnect retraction test, simulating the launch sequence in which the quick disconnect is retracted just before the rocket lifts off. The ship quick disconnect was reconnected five minutes later. According to current understanding, the next major milestone is the full-stack wet dress rehearsal, which may happen in the coming days. The road closure notice suggests rocket testing at Starbase will resume on Tuesday, January 17. We may witness the wet dress rehearsal on that day. Once the wet dress rehearsal is successfully completed, Ship 24 will be de-stacked for a Booster 733 engine static fire test. Once the static fire test is successfully completed and SpaceX receives a launch license from the Federal Aviation Administration, we will witness SpaceX's next-generation Starship rocket making its first orbital flight. According to Musk, even though a March launch attempt is highly likely, SpaceX will be ready for the test flight by late February. Super Heavy Booster 9 which had successfully completed two rounds of cryoproof tests last month, was brought back to the build site on January 10. Booster 9 is currently stationed inside the Mega Bay, and the vehicle will soon receive 33 Raptor V2 engines. Several Raptor engines for Booster 9 have already arrived at Starbase. Once the engine installation is complete, Booster 9 will be rolled out to the launch site to begin the static fire test campaign. Super Heavy Booster 9 which will be equipped with Raptor engines featuring electric thrust vector control system, is hugely different from previous Super Heavy prototypes. Please check out my previous update to learn about those design changes in detail, link in the description. The tip of a Starship nose cone lying on the build site was recently cut off. The nose cone will soon be placed inside a nose cone test rig for structural tests. A hydraulic ram will be inserted into the nose cone prior to the structural testing, and then a black cap will be installed on top of it. The hydraulic ram will put pressure on the nose cone during the test, simulating the conditions the nose cone will experience at max Q during an actual flight. The nose cone test rig is currently stationed at SpaceX's Massey's test facility. The nose cone structural test will be conducted at this location, located 7.5 kilometers from the Starbase build site. This test will evaluate recent Starship nose cone design changes. 
Several pipes that may have been designed for the launch pad water deluge system were spotted at Massey's lately. It appears that the launch mount will be upgraded with a water deluge system after the inaugural orbital flight test. Starship 22, which has been on display at the Rocket Garden for the past several months, is now being scrapped by SpaceX. Teams have started removing the ship's thermal protection system tiles, and one of the aft flaps was taken apart from the ship on Wednesday morning. Works on the Starship launch tower at Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39A are ongoing. The jig required to preassemble the launch tower arms has been fully erected. Furthermore, the chopstick carriage, which got there on January 6, has already been positioned above the jig. The launch tower arms were transported to Pad 39A from SpaceX's facility at Roberts Road on Thursday evening. These tower arms are shorter than the ones installed at Starbase. It is believed that they will be used only for stacking ships and boosters at Pad 39A. A second Starship tower at Kennedy will eventually be built to catch rockets launched from Pad 39A. Launch tower sections for that second Starship tower are being prefabricated at Roberts Road, however, the exact location of the launch tower is still a mystery. At Pad 39A, the carriage and tower arms will be joined together with the help of the preassembly jig very soon. Later, they will be lifted and installed on the launch tower with the help of a crane. Now, let's discuss some of the biggest updates in the world of science and technology from the past week. Virgin Orbit's first launch from the United Kingdom failed to reach orbit on last Monday, resulting in the loss of nine small satellites. The company's Boeing 747 carrier plane, known as Cosmic Girl, lifted off from Spaceport Cornwall on January 9, carrying the 21 meters long Launcher 1 rocket underneath its wing. The mission, dubbed Start Me Up, was the first international launch for Launcher 1, which carried satellites from seven customers, including commercial and government payloads from several nations. The aircraft flew to its designated drop location over the Atlantic Ocean, off the southern coast of Ireland, as planned, and released the Launcher 1 rocket. The rocket then ignited its first stage Newton 3 engine and ascended to space. According to preliminary data analyses, the first stage performed as expected, and stage separation, upper stage ignition, and fairing separation also went according to plan. Later in the mission, at an altitude of almost 180 kilometers, the upper stage experienced an anomaly, ending the burn of its Newton 4 engine. This event ended the mission, with the rocket components and payload falling back to Earth without entering orbit. Virgin Orbit has already initiated a formal investigation into the source of the second stage failure. Monday's mission was Virgin Orbit's sixth to date and its second launch failure. The next Launcher 1 mission is planned to occur from the Mojave Air and Space Port in California in late January. An RS-1 rocket, developed by California-based American private company ABL Space Systems, failed to reach orbit on its first demonstration mission on January 10. The 27-meter RS-1 rocket lifted off from a launch pad in Alaska on Tuesday in an effort to launch two tiny satellites into a 300 km polar orbit. ABL Space Systems did not webcast the launch, but instead provided updates via Twitter. Nearly 20 minutes after liftoff, the company announced that the rocket experienced an anomaly, shutting down all nine of its first stage engines simultaneously. The rocket later came back down on the launch pad, destroying the rocket and damaging the ground facility. The company did not disclose when after liftoff the shutdown took place or the altitude the rocket reached. RS-1 is a small launch vehicle capable of placing up to 1,350 kilograms into low Earth orbit. The two-stage spacecraft uses liquid oxygen and kerosene as propellants and has 92 engines in the first stage and one vacuum-optimized E2 engine in the upper stage. Tuesday's failure came after several scrubbed launch attempts in November and December. ABL Space is planning for another RS-1 test flight later this year. On December 14, as two Russian cosmonauts were preparing to conduct a spacewalk, the Soyuz MS-22 spacecraft docked to the International Space Station started to leak its coolant uncontrollably. The spacewalk was cancelled, and since then, Russian and U.S. space flight engineers have been analyzing the cause of the leak and its implications. After several days of investigation, they came to the conclusion that a micro-meteoroid struck the Soyuz spacecraft's exterior cooling loop at a speed of around 7 km per second, causing a 0.8 mm wide hole and releasing all of its coolants into space. The leaky Soyuz capsule ferried U.S. astronaut Frank Rubio and cosmonauts Sergei Prokopyev and Dmitry Pedelin to the space station in September for a six-month mission. The capsule was set to return to Earth in March carrying astronauts. But without an efficient way to radiate heat during the six-hour journey to Earth, the temperature inside the spacecraft could rise to more than 40 degrees Celsius, with high humidity. This could harm the flight computers needed to set a precise return trajectory, endangering the crew. 
The Russian space agency announced on January 11 that the Soyuz MS-23 spacecraft would fly to the space station without a crew on February 20 to replace the stricken Soyuz MS-22 capsule. Once the Soyuz MS-23 spacecraft docks with the station, the crew on board the space station will spend one to two weeks transferring equipment, like customized seat liners, from Soyuz MS-22 to MS-23. The damaged MS-22 will then return to Earth without a crew, but with some cargo. The three-member Soyuz MS-22 crew had been due to end their mission in March, but under the new plan, their mission will be extended until later this year. A SpaceX Dragon capsule splashed down off the coast of Florida on January 11, wrapping up a six-week cargo mission to the International Space Station. That mission, which marked SpaceX's 26th resupply flight to the ISS, was launched atop a Falcon 9 rocket on November 26, carrying nearly 3,500 kilograms of cargo into orbit. The spacecraft also carried two rollout solar arrays to the space station, which NASA astronauts installed during two spacewalks in December. Dragon undocked from the station on January 9 and headed back to Earth with about 2,000 kilograms of supplies and scientific investigations. The spacecraft's splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico occurred one day and 12 hours later. The next SpaceX resupply mission to the ISS, CRS-27, will be launched in February. SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 rocket topped with 41 web broadband internet satellites on January 9 from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. The rocket's first stage touched down on a landing pad at Cape Canaveral about 7 minutes and 45 seconds after liftoff, marking its second successful landing. The Falcon 9's upper stage, meanwhile, deployed the 41 web satellites over the course of about a 37-minute period, beginning 58 minutes after liftoff. OneWeb is assembling a network of 648 satellites that will provide internet service to customers worldwide. So far, the company has launched 542 satellites into orbit, mostly aboard Russian-built Soyuz rockets, operated by the French company Ariane Space. But Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 put an end to the Russian partnership with Ariane Space, prompting OneWeb to sign launch agreements with SpaceX and New Space India Limited, the commercial arm of the Indian Space Research Organization. Monday's launch was OneWeb's 16th to date. Only two more launches are needed to complete the first-generation constellation and enable global connectivity. SpaceX is planning to launch a Falcon Heavy mission for the U.S. Space Force on January 14 from Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center. The mission, dubbed USSF-67, will carry the second continuous broadcast augmenting SATCOM, a military communication satellite operated by the U.S. Space Force, along with the long-duration propulsive ESPA, a rideshare satellite hosting multiple experimental payloads. The satellites will be deployed into a high-altitude geosynchronous orbit, nearly 36,000 kilometers over the equator. The Falcon Heavy's two side boosters on the mission will land on landing zones at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Meanwhile, SpaceX will not attempt to recover the center core because it will use all of its propellants to accelerate the payloads into space. SpaceX has launched the Falcon Heavy four times, with the most recent mission taking place on November 1. The company has planned a total of five Falcon Heavy missions this year. Thank you for joining me for this week's science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.